Um, okay, so my name is Ivan Hardcastle. I'm an occupational therapist at Primary Therapy Source. Uh, we're learning about sensory integration. I went through several classes. I attended them down in Salt Lake. They're through uh, the University of Southern California. Um, and um, uh, Western Psychological Services. Anyway, so I am certified in sensory integration, uh, both in the assessment and, and the treatment level. Um, it affects a wide range of children uh, across a wide spectrum of disabilities. Anyway, so uh, as we go through what I learned about the uh, theory and, and other components of, of sensory integration, first of all, what is it? Um, Gene Ayers is the one that uh, back in the 60s and 70s started looking at sensory integration. What is it and you know, what's going on with some of these kids that have some different things going on? Um, she defined it as the organization of sensation for functional use. Or in other words, a neurological process that organizes sensation from the body and the environment, making it possible to use the body in the environment. We have all this information that comes in, or inside of us, and we need to make sense of it so that we can, we can act and we can function. Um, you can find sensory integration disorders in, in a wide range of, of kids. Uh, in the DSM-4, uh, in the ICD-9, if you understand what those, those are codes that uh, other medical professionals use, insurances use to define different diagnoses. <laughs> There is no number for sensory integration. What we find is that uh, it can exist by itself. You can have a child with a sensory integration dysfunction. And it also uh, is associated with a wide variety of other diagnoses. Uh, most commonly people think of this in the autism spectrum. Um, I have yet to meet a kid on the autism spectrum who does not have some sort of sensory integration dysfunction. Uh, other common ones are cerebral palsy, just de developmental delays. Uh, ADHD, AD, ADD, uh, anxiety disorders, Down syndrome, fragile X, um, basically you can have any diagnosis out there. And sometimes you won't, but sometimes you will have this uh, sensory integration dysfunction going on, uh, creating a, a more of a mix with a pot of, of what we're trying to treat and, and how the kid is child is able to function. What sensations are we looking at? We go through school. And we learn about touch and sight and smell and, and taste and hearing. And those are the sensi senses that we focus on. But there's more than that. There's sensations that, that are inside of our body that tell us about pain, that tell us about pressure, that tell us about movement. These are um, interoception and, and proprioception. Um, proprioception is the big one. And, and it says up here, vestibular and proprioceptive. Vestibular sense is your sense of balance, but it's more than that. It's also your, your orientation to the earth, your sense of security and knowing where your body is oriented. It's being able to bend over and know that you aren't falling down. Proprioception is very similar to it, and that, those come, that comes from nerves that are inside your joints, telling you how your body is moving. How can I touch my hands behind my back? and know, the, know where my fingers are going. Well, I've got nerve endings in my joints, and that is proprioception. Uh, also, you know, how do I know how, how much pressure I need to pick up this piece of paper or a cup without crushing it? That comes from proprioception. Uh, and then, of course, this external reception, which is what we were just talking about. Um, as, as of even before a child is born, they begin to integrate or mix sensations. Um, all children born have an innate inner drive to integrate sensation. They want to learn, they want to excel, they want to develop. Um, the vestibular sense is the very first sensation that really gets mixed in the pot. And this starts in utero, even before the baby is born. They start being able to tell movement and orientation. Um, as they're born, they can see, they can hear, they can touch, but it really isn't very meaningful to them. Um, as they encounter environmental demands, more and more systems come online, more and more systems start talking to each other and integrating so that the child is able to engage in more challenging tasks. Okay? So number one, um, so I, I have a, a brand new baby at home, and one of the first things that she is learning to do is develop her tap 
tactile sensation. So the mother-infant bond, uh, right after birth, she, she was placed right on, on my wife's chest. Uh, and you see that sucking effect. You think it touches her cheeks and she leans over and starts trying to find it with her mouth. Um, this develops. Okay, so you have touch and then you start, she's going to start crawling, she's going to start seeing, she's going to start moving. Project this all the way forward. Pretty soon we're riding a bike of how can how can my body know what my eyes are seeing? Can I hear the car coming to turn? Can I can I coordinate turning and, and keep my balance? Um, all of that it just combines and combines and gets bigger and bigger, more complex and more complex. This comes about um, through a combination of genes and experience. Uh, so certain families seem to have certain traits that are common to them. Uh, you, you, you'll see a family who they tend to be really great musician, musicians or they tend to be really good athletes and some of that is what they're exposed to. Well, if they've never picked up an instrument, maybe they aren't going to be the best musician, but you do see some genetic trends there. Um, on that same, on that same uh, line of thought, if they do pick up an instrument and they have a lot of exposure to that, they have the chance to integrate and develop neurons that are specific to that task. And so based on the genetic makeup, based on the experiences that they're provided with, uh, we can see different integration occurring. Uh, depending on this food or experiences or sensations from the environment that the brain can develop from. Um, of course, it's also dependent on physical characteristics. If you have a child who's born blind, they aren't going to be integrating visual information. If you have a child who can't hear, so it's the same, same sort of thing. Um, brains are very plastic. Uh, one impaired sense will often be compensated by another sensory system. This occurs both on, you know, if, if there's physical differences, it occurs, and even if there aren't physical differences, if there's just difficulty in one sensation or another or a combination of several, you will see other systems take charge. The most common one that I see is the visual system. A uh, child isn't able to discriminate very well with their hand. If they reach in their pocket and they're looking for a coin or a key or a pencil or an eraser, they can't tell what's in their pocket. We can. We can fill it out and know, but they might not be able to. And so what you'll see is that they pull it out, sit on the table, and there it is. Once I see it, we can do it. We can touch our fingers. We can touch our fingers up here. We can touch our fingers back here. If I work with kids who can touch their fingers, I can, I can, I can't touch my fingers, I, I can touch my fingers if I look at them, because I'm compensating with my vision. Um, but here, here's this example of this Batman, uh, and this is an example of the brain making adaptations when there is a physical uh, deficit. He was born uh, not being able to see, and his younger brother, uh, would always notice that he'd walk by, the, by his brother's room and he was talking into this can, making clicking noises. He just thought, oh, this is what my brother does. It's just kind of weird like that, okay. Well, what he did is that he actually changed the structure of his brain so that he could use echolocation uh, and taught himself to walk through neighborhoods and by clicking, he's able to discriminate even, even the height of a curve, even the location of a tree. Uh, this therapist that was interviewing him would take him out to parks and he could say, well, there's a tree over there and watch out for that curve and the grass kind of dips down over there. Uh, they put him on a bicycle and he could ride a bicycle completely blind. He's clicking, knowing where to steer. They thought, well, maybe he just knows his neighborhood. They took him into a completely different neighborhood and he was doing the same thing. She got so used to it that, that when they were going back to the car, she went onto the passenger side because he, he was going to drive and he, he just started laughing and said, well, I'm not that good. Um, and uh, anyways, and so the, the power of the brain to be able to change and develop new neurons is, is very great, and especially when our children are young. Our brains as adults, and even, even you know, into the end ranges, end ranges of age, they continue to change and continue to develop, but it's much slower than we get when we're very young. Uh, the brain is very old, very plastic. Uh, and children who have challenges, the faster we can get uh, the therapies or interventions that are needed, the better, because their brains can make the most changes. Um, okay. Different, uh, different
definitions here that I want to I want to get to. Uh, one is modulation. One is discrimination. Okay. Modulation on on the one hand is the how much. It's like a light dial. Uh, a lot of times you walk into a room, they'll have just a simple light switch. You either have the light on or you have the light off. Uh, there's no in between. This is a child who's very, I'm going, I'm running, I'm all around, or shut down, and I'm on the ground, and I'm asleep, or I'm very angry. There doesn't seem to be that middle ground. Okay. Discrimination, on the other hand, is more of the what. Uh, what am I feeling? What am I seeing? What am I touching? What position is my body in? And so you have these two different sides of sensory integration that we need to consider and talk about. Uh, one is, can I interact with the environment? And the other is, is can I keep myself regulated while I do so? Um, poor awareness of movement, balance, or touch usually is compensated by vision. We were just talking about that. Uh, such as a child losing their balance when their eyes are closed, or can I find objects in, in the pocket or drawer. Um, these are descriptions of poor discrimination. Okay? Um, as we're developing, uh, we did already start talking about this. During the first month, we have the touch responses. We have adjustments to joints, uh, especially pressure when they're being coupled. Um, sight and sound really aren't that strong yet. Through the second and fourth month, we begin integrating eye movements to, to head and neck positioning. Uh, you're creating a steady picture with the vision. You have a drive against gravity to lift the head, which then leads to crawling, which then leads to walking. You're getting automatic grasping in response to touch, which then makes us with vision to a more, a more refined uh, touch as well. Uh, four to six months, getting more larger movements that are unrefined. Uh, you're seeing big, big arm, arm movements, but not really down to the fingertips. Uh, you're, you're seeing increased joy in movement. Hey, look at what my body can do. I, I'm getting better and better, and you can see that in the child as sensation integrates further. Six to eight months, you're creating more locomotion, writing reactions, you get more bilateral uh, coordination, increased space perception as they're able to move through the environment. Now I can tell how far away that chair is because I can move there and come back and move there and come back. Um, refined fingers, increased sound differentiation. Nine to 12 months, you're looking at exploratory play, they're standing up, two years old, okay? Localization of touch and body perception. Uh, they know where the body starts, they know where the body finishes. Uh, they're exploring movement, they're getting much more, getting into everything. They're, they're like rough play because this tells me where my body is. If I slam it to my sister really hard, boy, that gives me really good feedback rather than if I just tap her. It's, it's a much stronger feedback system. Uh, three to seven years, increasing precision, expanding functions. Uh, they, they engage in this dangerous play and it drives those parents crazy. But what it does is that they're learning limits, uh, more and more refined, what are the limits of this body, what can I do? They're increasing in tool use, they're able to use pencils, they're able to use screwdrivers, they're all able to use a wide range of, of different things as, as their cessation integrates, okay? So this is super small, uh, nobody can read it, uh, unless you have much better vision than I do. Uh, but let me kind of talk you through here. This was developed by Gene Harris again. <clears throat> and different people have, have taken this and kind of tried to improve it. They always come back to here because uh, things tend to get left out if, if you try to improve it. Uh, but it looks both at a time and an integration uh, sort of model. And so here we have, on the very top is auditory or hearing. We have the vestibular and movement sense, okay, the position in space, proprioception, or where is my body, and then you have tactile down here, and, and the projector down here is cutting off vision, is at the very bottom. So I'll talk you through that, okay? So let's start with uh, auditory. We can see that it goes all the way down here, and it's going to combine the speech and language. Uh, that comes later. We already talked about the vestibular sense, that even in utero, this is developing. And as it comes along here, we have these brackets that's combining with the proprioceptive sense. Where are your muscles and joints? Where is my body in space? They combine, and here we have things such as eye movements, posture, 
balance, muscle tone, gravitational security. I know where my body is in space. But think of this as a time co continuum. Down here we have the tactile sense separate from the other. This is a sucking reflex, the eating, mother infant bond, tactile comfort. We're going to combine those now so that now we're looking at all three of these. And we have perception of the body. We have coordination of the two sides of the body, motor planning, activity level, attention span, emotional stability. Now how do you get that from your vestibular sense? What's really interesting is you know where your body is and you're secure in your body, the more where you become, the more that you're able to pay attention and focus and maintain that attention without feeling, I'm, I'm unsure of what's going on inside my body. If you don't know what's going on inside your body, you aren't going to be able to process information and have a good output. We're going to continue down here. You can see that this bracket goes all the way down, so we're combining vision now. We have eye and hand coordination, visual perception, purple soul activity. Back up here to the auditory sense, if you combine that with the vestibular sense, not only do well, we have speech and language. And you're thinking, well, what does the vestibular sense have to do with language? The combined, they, they're both located here in the ear. Uh, the vestibular sense is in the inner ear. And what you find is that they, they are very associated. If I have a child who isn't talking, and one of my speech therapists at, at the office is working with this child. If they take that child and put them on a swing, and we have a big wide variety of different types of swings, and you start moving this kid back and forth, they, just, they start making sounds. And then you can work with those sounds and refine them, but you can play around with these different links and tug on different strings and get the child to engage in different ways that they weren't doing before by understanding the correlation and interaction of these sensations, how they integrate, how they mix together. The end products, what do we want out of all the sensation interacting? We want the ability to concentrate. We want the ability to organize self-esteem, self-control, self-confidence. I know what's going on inside my body and I know how to respond to the environment. Uh, academic learning ability, they found correlations through English and math ability by children who have had, who've gotten treatment when they needed it for sensory integration. In the control group that didn't, didn't get treatment, you didn't, see this, you didn't see the same scores jump like you did in the other. Now are the therapists that are treating sensory integration, are they working on math? No. No, they're working on these basic skills back here. But you see them combining and we're getting these end products. Uh, capacity for abstract thought and reasoning, specialization on each side of the body uh, and of the brain. These are the, this is the end product, this is what we're looking at. So this next slide is very technical, okay? This is Ivan's brain model. This is actually what it looks like inside my head, okay? Uh, but what we have here, this is this, these are where the eyeballs would be, here's the nose. Um, so that this is the brain, this big red dot here is the thalamus. And that's located, if I were to draw a circle around that, right deep in here is the limbic system, okay? Out here is the frontal lobe, back here is the cerebellum, this is the brain stem. You can see these green arrows. This is sensation coming into the brain, okay? And it all comes up the brain stem, and where it parts is right here in the thalamus. This is kind of the big bus terminal, the big bus station of all sensation. And the sensation gets off the bus, and they decide, okay, you need to come over here with this sensation, we're going to mix, we're going to integrate so that we can get into the right different areas of the brain all over here, uh, and then we can function, okay? And that's normal. So then we have to consider, well, what happens if we have a child who maybe the signals don't get up to the thalamus, or maybe the signals get here, but they don't know what bus to get on. Or maybe they get on the wrong bus, or maybe too many people get on the bus who shouldn't be getting on the bus, or maybe the bus doesn't know where to go. Or maybe, a lot of times, we don't need all the information that gets up here. So in the morning, I put on a pair of socks, and they feel great in my toes. And five minutes later, I couldn't care what my socks felt like because I don't need to know what my socks feel like anymore. And so socks is coming up, and pretty soon it's, it's like, I don't care about my socks anymore. It's not even going to get on the bus. It's not going to try to go to a different area of the brain. I don't care. The 
doesn't always happen with some of these kids. They have socks, 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 socks all day long, and socks, 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 and then you have the noise of the projector, projector, and then you hear somebody down the hall, and then you hear somebody in the background talking, and then you hear a fan, and then you hear the noise of lights flickering. Some kids can hear that, I can't hear that. Um, and it drives them crazy, and it's so much information that they can't function. So you have this child in the class, and he's acting out because he's, he's being driven wild. He cannot focus, he can't function, he can't concentrate, because he isn't able to integrate sensation correctly, or normally, okay? Uh, for me, that, that can happen to us as well. This is me walking into Walmart on Black Friday. I can only handle it for so long, and then I've got to get out of there, because I can't take the pressure from people, and the noise, and the sounds, and, and I'm trying to look, I'm trying to scan for whatever whatever I was going in there that wasn't worth going in there for, uh, to me, uh, and i got to get out of there. And what you find, this is the discrimination side. Now the modulation side that we were talking about, that light switch, uh, if this is the limbic system, this controls emotional stability. That's one of the functions of the limbic system. Kind of the, the, the polar end of it is the frontal lobe. This is all our logic and reasoning. So I'm walking down the hallway in my house, and my wife jumps out from behind the door and rah, it scares me, okay? I have an immediate response, which is the limbic response. And my heart starts racing, and I <gasps> And then my frontal lobe engages and says, it's just my wife, she got me again, okay? And I'm going to be calmed down. My heart's still beating, but I know it's okay. Now, if my frontal lobe wasn't in charge, and I was based off of the limbic system. My wife jumps out, rah, it scares me, and I'm down the street running down, the neighbors are going, there he goes again, his wife scared him again, um, all, all the way down. Uh, this is what's going on with a lot of kids as well. They, their frontal lobe doesn't have a lot of control, and so the limbic system is taking the front seat. So you have things happen in the classroom, you have things happen at home, and you're getting these very emotional responses, very fight or flight, they might be aggressive, uh, sometimes they might just shut down and, and be very lethargic or fall asleep or not, not respond. They don't want to look at you. They don't want to interact. And it might just be because their limbic system is engaged and they need to get out. It's too much, too loud, too distracting, too disorganizing, and they can't handle it. Uh, lots of kids get in trouble at school because of this, and, and they, don't, they don't respond well to conventional behavioral methods because it's not a behavior thing, it's a limit. Um, quick disclaimer, okay. Uh, I do get parents who come in and, and we're saying, okay, we're, so we're looking at sensory integration, we're looking at a dysfunction that the child has, and they say, this is something I did. No. Maybe, I don't know, a small percentage, maybe yes, but the large percentage, no. There's a genetic component that might just be happenstance that things aren't functioning right. Uh, I have seen children that, yes, it was an environmental thing that caused their dysfunction. Well, the family that I'm dealing with, they had adopted this child. This child was in a foster system out of the country. Well, not a foster system, in a, in a orphanage where they were in a crib by themselves, there was no touch, there was no interaction with this child, their brain was literally starved for a sensation. Well, if the brain doesn't get food, you can't integrate, because there's nothing to integrate. That's, that's probably the, the, the biggest example I have of, yes, it was the environment. Uh, and that child made very good progress as we were able to provide um, the appropriate stimulation for the brain. Most other circumstances, it, it just kind of happens. Don't, don't blame yourself, don't feel bad. Uh, and then I congratulate the parents. It's, it's wonderful that you're here and we have things that can help that you can also work on at home. Okay? Um, challenges of, of physical differences in a child. If you have a child who can't see, if your child can't move as well, if your child can't hear. Um, looking back to the areas integration model, if you take out one of those sections, how is that? interfering with the outputs that we're looking at. Again, the brain is very plastic. We can make adaptations. We can make changes to the brain. But some of it may be very difficult to do, uh, depending on what system isn't working at full potential for typical or normal. Okay. 
uh, hearing impairment would affect speech and language. But uh, there might be also a, a combination of vestibular functions, concentration, organization, control because of the link between hearing and vestibular sense. A lot of times I'll see a, a child who can't see. And what you what you notice that the child is doing is that they might rock, be rocking. And, and I've had parents say, well, does that mean that my child's autistic? Because I know, I've seen other children who are autistic and they're rocking. And, and it's not. It's the brain remapping, trying to find other ways to engage in the world. They can't see, so what am I going to do? I'm going to move so I understand my body better. I'm going to rock, 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 so I understand space. And in that way, I'm going to compensate for vision through my tactile and proprioceptive senses. Okay? So those are just some, some examples. Uh, we already kind of talked about uh, the discrimination versus modulation. Um, let's talk about, uh, as far as modulation goes, how does that affect how I'm able to stay organized throughout the day. So we have the STEP SI model, and this was a class that one of my coworkers went to and came back, and we always present to each other. And what they found is that there is a baseline with variations through the day of, of how this child is able to focus. Okay? Uh, they might be over aroused, under aroused, uh, and they might have difficulty staying in the middle ground. So here's a really simplified model of the step SI. Okay? And uh, I'm not too computer savvy, so I just kind of threw this together. But if we were just to take a look at the kind of this middle range and say this is typical, and what you see is that you do have variations in whether you're under aroused, maybe I'm sleepy, maybe I don't feel good, maybe I am tired, or over aroused, I'm jumping off the walls, I'm running around, I'm screaming, I'm hitting, I'm biting, okay? And normal moves around, but it's bound within some ranges that allow us to focus and allow us to pay attention, okay? So then we have the next child and say that they are, once they wake up, this is, this is kind of a time as the day goes on, and they wake up in the morning and wow, they're up and they're running and just they're crazy all day long and the parents are exhausted by the end of the day. And now we have this child down here. Who the parents have to wake, 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 but this kid just will not get moving, but it's fairly easy to take care of because he really doesn't do much <laughs> throughout the day. He just doesn't really kind of interact. He just wants to be there asleep. He doesn't want to do many things, okay? So those are, those are three extreme examples, okay? Even for normal, this is kind of extreme. Most kids don't do that. Uh, we don't do that, okay? I wake up in the morning, and I'm down here. Oh, why is my alarm? Why did I set my alarm at 6? I get up, I shower, I start getting ready, and that bumps me into here somewhere. And I'm doing well, and I'm eating breakfast, and I arrive at work, and then my first kid comes into work, and, and he's one of these kids, and he comes downstairs, and he starts flailing, and maybe he scratches me, he bites me, and someone's going, and I go, what I got? I got to you know, save myself while I'm trying to help this kid, and then, and then lunch comes, and then 2 o'clock in the afternoon, it gets me every time, bam, I'm down here. Oh my goodness, can you get through this day and, and hopefully I can pull myself back up here, okay? We go through curves in this graph all day long. Most kids do. The problem is when kids can't find that middle ground. So they're down here, then they jump up here. Then they jump down here, then they jump up here. And this is the kid that isn't doing well in school because he can't focus because he's either jumping in his seat or working around. Stuff. Hold still, hold still. And he can't because his limbic system is in charge, and his frontal lobe, he can hear what you're saying, mm -hmm. but his frontal lobe isn't in charge, and you're having a limbic response. And so he's up here, and then maybe he crashes, maybe he's laid out on his desk, and he's not able to stay in the middle. The middle area is where we learn, is where we organize, is where we develop. And if we can't find time in there, it's okay to be up here, it's okay to be down there, but we need time in there to learn. And so you see children who aren't able to stay in there, and they're behind in all sorts of different skills. They might be behind in social skills, or fine motor skills, or gross motor skills, or reading, or anything, based on their ability to concentrate and organize by staying in this middle ground, okay? Um, testing that, that we can do. Uh, the best test 
is a sensory integration and praxis test. Um, I have been trained in that through the certification. Uh, it's highly accurate. It's very descriptive. It's also very lengthy. So a lot of times I cannot give this test unless I know the, the child beforehand when they're coming in. And then I can set up. Okay, this hour and the next week we're going to take another hour. Sometimes they don't get an hour. All right. So. The next best thing is that we do structured observations of specific sensory integration based tasks. Uh, so if the sensory integration praxis test is the middle of the bullseye, this next one is kind of the next ring out. Uh, and then the very last is the sensory profile. You, know, you can make the bullseye bigger and bigger, but this would be the third ring are these questionnaires of pain report. And they're just checking mark boxes or, or writing things down. Uh, so we can't, we don't get a specific score and some of it is very, you know, subjective as to, you know, what made they mark that day or how the child was doing. But it also gives very good input. And something's going on with this um, Signs of sensory integration dysfunction, okay? Besides looking at physical differences or difficulties with our sensory equipment, okay? Um, under over responsiveness to sensation, where they be touched, you, you touch them and they don't respond, or you touch them and holy cow, you know, the world just explodes. They're standing in line at school and a kid bumps them, that kid just hit me, bam, and they hit the kid because they didn't know how to process that touch, okay? Uh, it could be with hearing, it could be with movement. They get very easily frustrated, and you wouldn't expect them to be so frustrated with certain tasks when it happens. And maybe, probably, it's because of some sensory integration dysfunction. They're very concrete in how they play. Very little fantasy. Uh, inability to pretend. They're very clumsy. They like to sit down and do a lot of fine motor things. They might not be very good at them, but they prefer that to running around and engaging with peers. Uh, on the contrary, they might prefer to run around, but they aren't engaging with peers, and they aren't very organized with how they're running around either. Uh, poor fine motor skills, uh, can't use scissors, can have really bad handwriting. Uh, sometimes I'm going to look at these, some of these kids trying to hold a pencil and it's just like, they have no idea what they're doing. Either. They don't know. They can't figure it out. Uh, a note on social participation. Um, if you're looking at, okay, how does sensory integration affect the ability to engage socially? Okay, so we have to look back at the body and how is the body interpreting information. If we start with proprioception, and we say proprioception is sensation from the joints that are controlling, where do I know where my body is in space, how do I know how much pressure I'm using, which is helping me define my own personal boundaries around me, okay? If, we, if that isn't functioning, then I'm going to have low body awareness. I don't know where my body is. If I have low body awareness of personal boundaries in space, then I cannot understand other people's body language. I can't do it. I don't have a basis of, of understanding at, at point A. And so all this stuff around me is chaotic to me. And so you see these kids in, in school, and I don't want to go in there. This is just mass chaos, and it's very overwhelming. Um, poor ability to interpret peer interactions. Uh, and so then they are not interacting, or they're interacting inappropriately. They did a study and they showed these uh, twins. And they took them to a playground. And there was a few kids playing on the playground. And it was very simple. There's some stairs, there's some slides. It's, it's like a playground that you see at a, at a park now, one of the newer, you know, metal painted rails, and everything's safe. Um, and they just stood there. They would not go on the playground. Well, they had very, very poor body awareness. They had no idea how to interact on the playground. So then they took him back and they put him through therapy and they didn't show him back on the playground. What they did is they, they showed him playing soccer, which if you think of the difference between the playground and soccer, the playground's stable. They only need to pay attention to themselves unless another kid gets in the way. In soccer, they're paying attention to themselves and their teammates and the other team and the ball and the ref and there's noise and there's movement and there's chaos and they were out to play. What a big difference from where they started to where they were able to end up by making sense of body perception. Uh, more signs of sensory integration dysfunction. Okay, delayed self-dressing. 
I don't know where my arm is to put my arm through my armhole. Okay. Uh, the major motor milestones are often very normal. They learn to run. They learn to jump. They learn to crawl. They learn to roll. They learn to walk. But when you are combining those in dynamic situations onto a playground or onto a soccer field or somewhere else, then it becomes very difficult. They can't combine more than one. And that's where the complexity comes in. Um, on that same note, uh, if you have a child who gets that limbic response and they're over aroused and they, they aren't able to know what to do with themselves, often they fall back on these motor milestones. They want to run or they want to climb. Um, a lot of kids do this. If you're looking at uh, kids with, uh, a lot of kids I see that uh, say have ADHD, what are the things that they want to do first? Well, they want to get down and they want to run up to the ladder and they got to climb, 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 or run, 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 run here, run there. And it's a way for them of trying to become more organized by giving sensation that is meaningful. But, uh, as we can see, they're trying their hardest, but it's not a very good plan. And so what we're doing as therapists is that we're teaching them a better way to help them get organized to come into that middle ground. If you're thinking back to the step aside model, getting into that middle area. Uh, poor timing, poor sequencing of motor actions, difficulty in social relations that we were just talking about. Uh, they prefer to play with younger kids or they prefer to play with adults. And why is that? Well, if I'm Johnny, I'm five, and I've got a younger sister who's two, if I play with the younger sister, I'm in charge. And I can determine what's going to happen. I can predict things. And the more that I can predict, the less chaos there is, and the, better, the easier it is for me to integrate what's going on, because I know what's going to be there. Or, if I'm Johnny and I want to play with mom and dad, Oh my goodness, as adults, we are so predictable. We do the same things again and again and again, and he knows how we're going to play with him. And so again, we are in a very safe zone. But when he goes to school and plays with his peers, they all want to be in charge too. And they're running around in chaos, and it, I can't be in charge. I can't control the situation. I can't make sense of it anymore. Um, poor social awareness, awkwardness, we were already talking about that. General learning difficulties, inconsistent energy expenditure. Uh, they might have very poor endurance. They have a, might have a quick burnout. They might do very well at home and be able to run, 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 have energy, and they're doing this and doing that, and then you take them for a walk. Oh, I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm tired. You're in a new situation. Maybe there's dogs barking. Maybe it's an unfamiliar street. Maybe there's cars moving. Maybe there's you know, a wide range of things that isn't in their normal, predictable habits and routines. And so then it's much harder to process. And the rain down into it. Um, poor tolerance to change. This is the same thing. I need to be predictable. And if it's not predictable, it's much harder for me to process. Uh, poor imitation and, and poor placing those. Uh, it's associated with uh, learning disabilities. Poor ideation. What is ideation? Ideation is motor planning, but with a cre creative component. Thinking about our kids with, uh, who, who ended up playing soccer, they went to the playground. That's one of the things that was the problem. I see the playground, I can walk across the grass, but I have no idea how to interact with that new object. I've never seen it before. I don't know how to put the motor patterns that I already have into a new situation. That's ideation. Um, you can't come up with an idea. You have poor handwriting, poor organization, behavior, um, especially in, in school age children. Um, they might prefer very rough play. How does sleep? Uh, how does that affect sensory integration? We use energy through processing with our brain. That's why we need continual food through our senses, but also also through our body. Well, if we get poor sleep, we know as adults that if we get poor sleep, we don't think very well. A lot of adults self-medicate with coffee because it's a stimulant that helps the brain keep going, okay? Um, we only have so much energy that can be used throughout the day. And if we aren't getting good sleep, that amount of energy is decreasing each day. So these children, if they aren't sleeping well, they don't have a good reserve to start with. And if uh, I have kids who 
are still working on sensory integration things, but they're old enough that they are aware of that they are different from their peers. And so they go to school and they are hyper-focused on, I know that people look at me funny when I, when I, when I can't stop twitching in class, so I'm not going to twitch. Or I'm going to pay close attention to the teacher, or I'm going to do this, or I'm going to do that, and I'm going to hold it together. And what happens is that they only have this much energy, and by the end of the school day, they use that up. And they get off the bus, and what is the very first thing that happens when they walk in the door? They lose it. They have a huge meltdown. They're, they're done. They're, they're burnt out. They have nothing left. Uh, some of these kids even lose bowel and bladder function. There, there is no control left. They, they have used up all the energy, try, just trying to get through the school day, um, so they don't stand out. Uh, but they get into the comfort of Praxis is related to ideation. Praxis is the conceiving and carrying out of a sequence of unfamiliar actions. I like to think of my first time learning how to drive a stick, okay? And I already knew how to drive a car. You grab the wheel and you have the gas pedal, okay? And I can gas and brake and I can turn corners and I do the wiki thing, okay? And suddenly I'm in a stick and I have this other pedal that I've never played with. And I've got this thing down here, so now I'm driving with one hand. I've got the thing I can, I can move my foot. I can move this arm. I can move this arm and I can move this other foot. But then I have to put them all together. I have to integrate them. And the first time I'm trying to go and it's like, and it's horrible. And the guy in the passenger seat is going, oh, why should I use my car to try and teach this guy? Well, the more that we do it, the more those be those smooth out. And rather than individual motor plans, they become one automatic new system. Well, this is praxis, okay? The lack of that is, is what we call dyspraxia. Uh, for perception and praxis, this is very similar to what we were just looking at with the social participation. If you have lax joints, you're, you're decreasing the input or the neurological responses from those joints. You have poor body awareness, which leads to poor motor planning, leads to observed clumsiness. Okay? So it's the same pattern that we're seeing in the social uh, participation. Uh, in, in relation to this, now the study that, that was looking at this was looking specifically at children with autism, but this is, does relate to praxis as well. Uh, typical response time to a given situation. I know we could put anything in here. For a typical child, give them two seconds and, and they're responding well. Okay. A child with autism, or you could substitute this, a child with a sensory integrative deficit. A child with autism, you're looking at 17 seconds. Okay. We could throw, I don't know the exact number for a child with a sensory integration, integrative deficit because all children are different. It might be five seconds, it might be 15. I've seen some kids who are very low arousal and you do something, and it's like 30 seconds later, all of a sudden they look. That just gets, you know, they try it again and it's, it's the same thing, and you have a delayed response. Uh, sometimes we're just giving too much information and we're not letting the child process. Yes? So if you have a child with a sensory impairment, like that, yes. and then they're also autistic, yes. you're looking at a huge latency. Yes. Um, not necessarily combined, but yes, you're looking at a latency in, in their ability to respond. So if you're trying to teach a deaf kid with autism to use sign language, that's almost an impossibility because they're not using the eye contact to get the language. Now we could go back on, on eye contact. Let's come back. Write that one down. We're going to come back to it. Okay. Um, but uh, you're looking at it, it's going to be a much slower process. Um, poor imitation of peers, if you're looking at dyspraxia, um, it's changing so quickly, how can I process it? Uh, how can I organize and motor plan dynamics in dynamic settings? Uh, they prefer to play by themselves rather than with other kids because you cut out so many other variables. The same thing with routines and tolerance to change. If I can predict it, if I know it's going to happen, I can process it much better. Uh, if we 
Uh, we keep our houses in a certain order. The couch is here, the, t the table's there, the TV's there, okay? And every so often we like to switch it up and put the couch over here and the TV over there and the table there, and we're okay with that. But if we have problems processing, think if, if I were to wake up every day and somebody in the middle of the night had rearranged my whole house and just arranged everything, and, and, so, and I'm not even waking up in the same room anymore, what is that going to do to me? What, what would that do to you? Drive me nuts. I have no idea you're going to wake up and I have to reorganize everything for that new day. Uh, we go, you go on trips and it's, it takes more energy to be organized on trips because you're in a new environment and you know things are missing from what you typically would have. You're out of routine. Some of these children, even though things stay the same in our house, you know other things might throw it off. Maybe this morning the bus came a little late, or maybe it was a different cereal, or maybe it was that who knows a wide variety of things uh, can throw a can throw a child off. Um, they have a much more narrow tolerance to change. They are much more dependent on, I need the same routine, I need the same habits going on. So here's, this, this, this is going to be part of the answer to your, your question on how I teach in this child with autism who, who can't hear. Um, some key strategies for, for teaching and interactivity with these kids. Um, asking questions to help the child focus, learn on their own. Uh, you know, hey, these steps here. I don't, I don't know how to get up those steps. How are we going to get the steps? I, they go up there. Looks like there's a really fun toy up there. How are we going to get to the toy? Um, trying to pull what they have and expand what they have already so that they're learning from the inside rather than external. Move it to your foot here, put your foot here. Uh, giving them more control of what they're doing. Model while thinking about it. If they're getting out and say, hey, what if I put my foot here? And then see if they can copy you. Uh, you know, it doesn't work well. Hey, why, why did that? Why did that happen? How come? Oh man, we fell down. How come we fell down? Uh, providing additional knowledge for successes as needed. They're still not getting it. You don't give tidbits as as they're going along. Uh, using visual schedules, lists, plans. This helps with the predictability of events. If they know what's going to happen next, they can see it. They can mark it. Even if uh, we've used schedules and, and put them up in a different order where the child knows to go to that schedule and say, well, after playtime, then it's going to be snack time. And after snack time, then I get you know, a little bit of TV and then it's going to be this. And then and they can, they can see it and know exactly what's going on in their day. And you'll see, you see decreased behaviors and you'll see increased organization and increased ability to focus and concentrate uh, by using things such as visual schedules or, or other similar components to that. Talking the child through task steps. Adding emotion, okay, appropriate level, appropriate level of goofiness or silliness or teasing. You can go overboard with that. Um, but using an appropriate level of, of added emotion that makes it much more obvious to the child what is going on, okay? Uh, make connections to new tasks. Hey, you know, here we were and we were stacking these blocks and they went up and up and up and we made a good building and now we're going to use this green stacker. If you have a child who's dyspraxic, they don't, they can't, they aren't going to transfer that skill over. That's a different task. Hey, this is kind of like the blocks and they go on and they stack up and up and up and up and maybe the, you know, the, the child's little start, oh yeah, it, it is kind of the same skill, okay? Um, you only want to change as little as you can, working from one task to the next. I went from stacking vertically, stacking up with blocks, to stacking up with the ring stacker. I didn't go from blocks to a three-dimensional Lego ship. Now, that's way too complex. How do you, you know, I skip too many steps here, but I'm going to go from one to the next. Beginning with what's familiar and expanding from there, using playful obstruction, using exaggeration, imitating the child and then expanding on that, uh, allowing for lots and lots and lots of repetition. The more that you can allow for repetition, the better they'll do. Even, even in normally developing children, if you're looking at you know, when a child is climbing stairs, uh, they go up a step and then they go down a step. They go up a step and they go down a step and, and you're just thinking, you just went up a step, you know how to do it now. But they do it again and again and again and again and they 
do it so many times so that it becomes ingrained and a very firm motor path is made for that. We need to think about that in a, in a wide range of different difficulties that these children are having and apply that same principle, uh, not just for motor finding, but also cognitive functions and, and interaction skills. Um, what are we getting at? Uh, just, a, just a reminder, we were looking at some of this before. Uh, an improved engagement in activities, improved ability to hold still, pay attention, increased tolerance to change, improved ability to generalize, improved social language, fine motor skills, practice, organizational skills, and the very best one, and of course this is cut off, is improved quality of life for the family. That is what we want to see. We want to see that things happen in our happy home, because that's, that can be the most important thing. Uh, a few last words. Early intervention improves the outcome because of brain plasticity. Uh, modulation difficulties may be observed at birth. Um, with with my second daughter um, in the hospital. Now, if, if I if I had graduated already, this is while I was still in school. I would have noticed. I had no idea what was going on. This is in retrospect. She would go down into the nursery. And just be screaming, screaming, screaming. The nurse would bring her back through the quiet hallway into the dark room where my wife was, and she was just happy as a lamb. And she didn't want to eat, and she did, wasn't fussy. And so my wife would send her back, and then pretty soon the nurse would come back, and this happened again. And again, pretty soon the nurse was so frazzled, she, she wasn't even checking the, the little bands that they have. And my wife thought, okay, I'm just going to keep this baby. And she slept through the night, just fine, in the hospital. Um, we later found out that she has modulation difficulties. She does not have that dimmer switch. She's either up or she's down. And that was what was going on. You can see the birth. Uh, discrimination is much harder to see until they're about the age of four or five. And looking at that, that's because up until about that age, you're looking at those basic motor patterns, the crawling, the running, the walking. It's when they get to that age that they start combining them in new ways that we can start measuring with greater accuracy, the differences between them and their peers. Um, where are they behind? Um, research and evidence. Um, I always, I have yet to include um, all the references um, up there that I have. I've got binders of them. Um, generally, because I, I haven't run into a class that's, that's asked for them yet. But, uh, you can know that there is lots of research on the underlying sensory systems and how they associate and on treatment patterns. And you have research in all the way across that model that we were showing before. The majority of studies that are being done on sensory integration are case studies. They aren't large groups of children being put together. Sometimes it might be five, sometimes it might be ten, but it's not the three hundred, it's not the five hundred amounts of groups of kids in the study. The reason why? Because children are so different. And if you look at a broken arm, a broken arm is a broken arm. Yeah, there's different types of broken arms. But you can categorize those types of broken arms. You can look at how they're going to be fixed. But a child with a sensory integration dysfunction, they're so unique, and each one is such a different puzzle, that it's much more effective to look at each one by themselves, or a few that are similar in the group, than to try to lump a big group together because there will be too many differences and the study won't be effective. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so a lot of these, every, every month, when I get, uh, every two months, when I get the American Journal of Occupational Therapy, there's always an article, new research on the sensory integration. Uh, it's really being pushed to continue this research. And then they're taking a look at these case studies and then combining and taking a look at, at the similarities between them. The, the research is exploding. Um, there is no cookbook answer to a child with a sensory integration dysfunction. There's some really good strategies out there. There are some general things. But sometimes those general things don't happen, so then we go to a different thing. There is no specific protocol that says we're going to start here because maybe it's the tactile system, maybe it's the visual system, maybe it's the proprioceptive system. And maybe you're combining discrimination with the modulation. Sometimes it's the modulation all by itself. Sometimes, and they mix and match, and it, it sometimes it gets into a big mess. And it's fun to figure out what sorts of things are going to help these children. I had uh, one kid.
that I was recently looking at. Um, when I first started with him, boy, he was just running around. He couldn't, he couldn't sit down to play. He couldn't pay attention to, to even the gross water gas. He, uh, he, he would not engage. He was very rough, very agitated, very angry, very, uh, you know, he had hit at his mom and, and scream and yell and wasn't sleeping well at night. And we were trying some different things. One of the, one of the, the, the magic bullets is deep pressure. And so you're looking at weighted vests. A lot of people have heard about compression vests. Or having the child you know, push heavy things. Um, any of that sort of task. And so I was trying to get this child to pick up some of these medicine balls, the, the weighted exercise balls that we have, and just carry them over and put them in another box. He wasn't doing it, wasn't doing it. Finally, I got him, so he was sitting in my lap, and I had a couple of these, and I'm piling them on him just to give him some just heavy weight station. And just kind of playing around, I took one and I put it on top of his head. And I, I never do that. I don't know why I did that. I was just being silly. And I put it on his head and going on and it just went. <gasps> <sighs> and I took it off and started getting agitated again. So I put it back on. It's like. <sighs> and so for the next couple of weeks, when I heard it went in, that's what we started with. We rolled a mess of ball on his head. And his mom would. Go home, and when he started getting agitated, she would put pressure on his head. It was the weirdest thing. And he comes in now, and he's working with a different therapist now. And we don't, we don't need to put the ball on his head anymore. Because what has happened is that we've done so much, we've strengthened a pathway in the brain, we've changed the structure of the brain, so that that part of his lymph system, that aspect of sensory integration, is much more organized, and the frontal lobe can have more control. So then he can come in and he can get right back down to, okay, we were working on stacking or covering them. How's he holding the crane? He can move right to those because he has the brain structure that's been changed.